Welcome everyone to this very special session of the 65th Commission on the Status of Women. This is the screening to the film Glimpses into the Spirit of Gender Equality. And this is a feature length film that has been made in celebration of the 25th anniversary on the Beijing Platform for Action. My name is Sophia Ramishva and I serve as a representative of the Baha'i International Community to the United Nations here in New York City. And this event is brought to you in co-sponsorship with the permanent mission of the Philippines to the United Nations. I'd like to honor the presence of members of the permanent missions to the United Nations of the Philippines, Liberia and Colombia and members of their government delegations who are with us today. And as we are getting settled in, um, feel welcome to introduce yourselves in the chat so we can get a sense of who is on the call with us today. You're welcome to share your name and your organization and the country in which you're currently based. For those of you who are joining us via the live stream, we are currently convening on the NGO Committee on the Status of Women virtual platform, which, which is hosting over 25,000 participants from all over the globe in over 700 parallel events. And this is the first time we are convening alongside a virtual UN Commission on the Status of Women. So we're very glad to have your participation also um, online, live streamed. Um, so thank you to those who are joining us over YouTube and Facebook Live today. So in terms of our time together, I'll share a little bit of context and background to the film. We also have four ambassadors to the United Nations who have provided opening remarks to this special screening for the Commission on the Status of Women today. We will watch the 40 minute documentary together and this film has really been designed as a tool to elicit conversation around gender equality. So if you feel that it's helpful to your own work um, on gender equality, please feel welcome to use it, screen it in your own circles, share it with your networks, but today on the call, we're wanting to really get your thoughts and reactions to the film. So it's hoped that everyone on the call today will have a chance to share something um, in reaction to the film. And so in order to do this, after we hear from our ambassadors and we, we watch the film, we're actually going to move into some breakout groups. And these breakout groups will be open forums, really just for us to meet and share and discuss some of the themes of the film more in depth. Um, and we look forward to, to moving into those breakout groups with you. So in terms of a little bit of background to the film itself, this film is really trying to reflect on some of the advances that have been made at the international level since the 1995 conference in Beijing. And it aims to tie those advances with the simultaneous progress that has been happening in communities on the ground. And so the film touches on the lives of individuals from diverse communities, including Colombia, India, Malaysia, the United States, and Zambia. And it draws out a range of themes, in particular, the role of community and education, the role of men and boys in advancing gender equality, as well as the role of religion. And we're seeing um, also the leading role of young people in moving change on the ground. And what is really unique about this film is that it's aiming to instill a sense of hope and optimism as humanity is working to realize this principle and the practical expression of gender equality in the world. And as we're working to recommit our efforts within the UN system towards the vital requirement of gender equality. And as we, we work to living out this principle in our own lives, we're moving forward with our eye on the long arc of history and aiming to remember that the trajectory of humanity's future is bright. So with that, we will turn first to hear from our ambassadors. So we have um, ambassadors from the permanent missions of the Republic of the Philippines, of Germany, of Liberia, and of Portugal to the United Nations. And I'll, I will introduce them one by one. And they will share first their reflections on the film, um, as well as some advances that have been happening in their countries over the past 25 years. And we are very honored to have such high level support for this film at the Commission on the Status of Women this year. So we will begin with our co-sponsor, uh, the permanent representative of the Republic of the Philippines to the United Nations, 
Ambassador Enrique Manalo, and we will start with his pre-recorded remarks. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. This is what we profess in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We have reaffirmed these principles at the UN in various conventions and resolutions. These principles underpin the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. These principles are crucial for our collective achievement of peace and prosperity. My country places great importance to gender equality. The Philippine Constitution declares it a policy that the state recognize the role of women in nation building and shall ensure the fundamental equality before the law of women and men. In Beijing in 1995, my government, along with other member states, committed to mainstream gender in all aspects of development processes to achieve a society where men and women contribute to and benefit from development. The Philippines pursues gender mainstreaming by requiring all government agencies to use at least 5% of its budget appropriations for gender and development programs. Without proper funding, gender equality will only be rhetoric. The law Women in Development and Nation Building Act mandates all government agencies to institute measures that would eliminate gender biases in all of government and to ensure that women are given the means to participate fully in nation building. Applying a gender lens in evaluating government policies and projects is essential in gender mainstreaming. In 2009, the Philippine Congress passed the Magna Carta of Women, the Philippines' local translation of the provisions of the Sidao. The Sidao itself has its roots in the Philippines, its first draft having been prepared by Filipino diplomat Leticia Ramos Shahani. The Magna Carta of Women is a comprehensive women's human rights law that seeks to eliminate discrimination through the recognition, protection, fulfillment and promotion of the rights of Filipino women, especially those in the marginalized sectors. Many other laws have been passed by the Philippine Congress to decree the principle of gender equality. The Anti-Violence Against Women and Their Children Act addresses violence committed against women and their children. It covers all types of violence, physical, mental, psychological, and economic. The Anti-Sexual Harassment Act protects against sexual harassment in employment, education, or training environments. The Safe Spaces Act expands this protection to online spaces. Legislation is important in achieving gender equality. The law has the teeth to make it comply. But laws and regulations alone are not sufficient. Change must start from the ground from within homes and families. Social norms and stereotypes are learned at a young age. Children form gender biases from hearing and observing adults. Mores that make young girls accept inferiority to their male peers will influence all aspects of their life as they grow older. Beliefs that exclude boys from any undertaking because of their gender hurt them too. Gender equality benefits both girls and boys. Thus, social community and educational processes that foster equality between boys and girls must be promoted. Education is a pathway for gender equality. Education is a universal human right, but data shows that girls still account for a greater percentage of primary school age children who are out of school in less developed and developing countries. Without equal access to education, it would be impossible to achieve gender equality. We are pleased that since Beijing 1995, the world has made massive progress in educating girls. UNESCO reports 
show that 180 million more girls have enrolled in primary and secondary education compared to a generation ago. In the Philippines, more women than men are enrolled in colleges and universities. Consequently, more women have also risen to leadership positions and senior roles. These are some of the factors that have made the Philippines rank first in Asia in the 2020 Global Gender Gap Index. No country has achieved full gender equality, but we have achieved many gains since Beijing. Maternal mortality has gone down substantially. Incidence of child early and forced marriages has declined, and almost all countries penalize violence against women. The nexus between gender and the environment is now widely recognized. The pandemic, however, threatens to erode the gains achieved in the advancement of women. Existing inequalities have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Gender-based violence and domestic abuse, as well as online trafficking of women and girls, exponentially rose as the virus forced people indoors. Women and girls who are without access to virtual education platforms will also fall behind. We must therefore develop partnerships to advance the goals of Beijing, as well as to preserve the gains achieved so far. Partnerships are key to promoting gender equality and women empowerment. In this regard, member states, UN agencies, local and international NGOs, civil societies, faith-based organizations, and the private sector all have important roles to play. During the 65th session of the Commission on the Status of Women, the Philippines reaffirms its commitment to the full and effective implementation of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. I congratulate Baha'i International Community for an excellent feature film on gender equality. I am honored to have been invited to add my voice to many gender equality champions who have spoken. Thank you. Thank you to Ambassador Manalo and the permanent mission of the Philippines to the United Nations for this contribution to the opening of the event today, especially for outlining the positive work that the Philippines has been doing to advance the status of women, and also this point that was made about education being a pathway for gender equality. We've also received some pre-recorded remarks from the ambassador of the permanent mission of Germany to share with us today. So we will now turn over to ambassador Hoiskin for his opening remarks. The United Nations was founded on the promise to always strive for bringing peace, development and human rights to all. These are the three pillars of the United Nations. The UN's engagement to actively work on women's rights and the achievement of gender equality came about later. But the need to defend women's rights was enshrined in the founding promise of the UN from the beginning. In the normative framework of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to bring equal rights to all. Women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. These famous words were pronounced by former First Lady of the United States, Hillary Clinton, during the adoption of the 1995 Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. In 2020, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action here at the General Assembly. Chancellor Angela Merkel participated in the virtual celebrations with a video message. Germany is proud that we have had a woman leader for almost 16 years now. But with only 7% of the world's heads of government being women, the majority of women and girls are unable to see themselves reflected in their leaders. This has to change. The political and public sphere as well as the workplace have to adopt. This is also one of the priority themes of this year's Commission on the Status of Women. Germany is about to introduce a landmark legislation with legally binding quotas for having women on company boards. We experience this ourselves. Goodwill is not enough. 
Pledges are not enough. Quotas are an effective instrument on the way to gender equality. 2020 was also the year that the COVID-19 pandemic hit globally, exacerbating gender stereotypes and negative social norms in all parts of the world. This came with a real pushback on women's rights and gender equality, including rising levels of sexual and gender-based violence, intimate partner violence and the loss of income and livelihood, particularly for women, as well as higher risk to girls' education and well-being. Many member states, civil society and UN women are therefore calling for heightened action to counter the shadow pandemic of exasperating gender equality. In the beginning of this documentary, it says that the search for purpose has no gender. I would add, there is no space in society where gender equality has no purpose. This becomes particularly evident when we look at the role of religion in promoting gender equality. Freedom of religion or belief is a human right, and Germany is a staunch defender of everybody's right to believe or not to believe. Religion has to play its part in protecting and promoting gender equality, in defending sexual and reproductive health and rights, in advocating for the rights and freedoms of all persons to determine their sexual orientation and gender identity. Everybody has to play their role in this and, as one of the protagonists of the documentary says, we have to overcome toxic masculinities. It's women, men and persons with diverse gender orientation who all benefit from gender equality. During our two-year term at the Security Council, Germany worked extensively on these topics and strengthened the women, peace and security agenda. But our work is far from done here and we have to roll up our sleeves. No country or community should seek this by themselves. We need real partnership for gender equality between member states, civil society, private companies, youth organizations and religious communities to overcome the pushback on women's rights due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I commend the Baha'i community for taking up this important task and engaging with the United Nations, member states and civil society ahead of this 66th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. And I commend the Baha'i to undertake this initiative at the moment where in many places we face a lot of pushback on gender equality also in the European Union. And I commend the Baha'i for this initiative where the Baha'i themselves are under massive pressure in Iran, where they are under unacceptable pressure against them to exercise their freedom of religion. Thank you to Ambassador Hoiskin and the permanent mission of the Federal Republic of Germany to the United Nations for this contribution. Also for highlighting the unique role of religion in promoting gender equality and Germany's continued efforts in promoting the right to the freedom of religion or belief around the world. I'd now like to share the remarks from the Ambassador of Liberia to the United Nations, Deputy Permanent Representative Davies. Distinguished friends, let me start off by first expressing my gratitude to the Baha international community. And I'm honored by the invitation to share my perspective on the screening of a gender equality film in honor of the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, the ingenious agenda on women's empowerment and rights. I am happy that the discourse on gender equality has galvanized the necessary awareness it deserves, regardless of our racial, religious, educational, and cultural backgrounds. Ladies and gentlemen, as we mark CSW 65, during this period, let's be cognizant that we have so much work to do towards achieving gender equality. And let's not be complacent with what we have together achieved in this respect. 
especially that COVID-19 has severely undermined the progress regarding the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, the Resolution 1325, and the Sustainable Development Goal 5. I believe there should be no barriers to what a woman can achieve or become. Women are equally competent as men when given the opportunity. Let us consider political leadership, for example, in which we have had prominent women leaders and still do today. The likes of Sirumavo Banaraniki of Sri Lanka, Indira Gandhi of India, Goda Meir of Israel, Margaret Thatcher of the United Kingdom, Angela Merkel of Germany, and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia, just to name a few. Today, the world's youngest Prime Minister is Her Excellency Sanna Marie of Finland. In Sudan, the women led by Allah Salah have positively changed the political landscape of Sudan. Kamala Harris has become the first female Vice President of the United States of America. Women have also made and continue to make headways in other respects. NASA astronauts Jessica Meir and Christina Koch took part in the first all-women space walk in October 2019. 18 years old Greta Thunberg has become the face of the global movement for hashtag climate action and the list goes on and on. Gender equality is an offshoot of human rights, a domain in which women have also significantly contributed. Rosa Parks, for example, is recognized as the flair that inspired the U.S. civil rights movement. Eleanor Roosevelt was instrumental in formulating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights when she served as chair of the United Nations Human Rights Commission. Her words during the submission of the declaration still resonate with us today. And I quote, We stand today at the threshold of a great event, both in the life of the United Nations and in the life of mankind, unquote. For Liberia, we can proudly celebrate the significant contribution of Liberian women, both in leadership and in conflict resolution and peace building. In 1969, a Liberian diplomat and lawyer Madam Angie Brooks Randolph became the first female president of the United Nations General Assembly and the first female from Africa. In 2003, Liberian women acted courageously to end the civil upheaval in Liberia when they embarked on a sustained mass action campaign for peace and democracy, which pressured warring parties and other stakeholders to negotiate and broker a peace deal referred to as the Accra Comprehensive Peace Agreement. Liberia also elected the first female president of Africa mentioned above and currently has the first female vice president, Joa Hava Tiller. Additionally, we currently have six female ministers in the president's cabinet and women occupy 65% of assistant and deputy ministerial posts in government. There are two female associate justices at the Supreme Court out of the membership of five. On the, on the downside, women representation at the level of the legislature is extremely low. However, the government and people of Liberia have vowed to change this narrative. To demonstrate full commitment to achieve Sustainable Development Goal 5, we adopted the revised national gender policy launched in 2017, which seeks to promote gender equality, social economic development, and the enhancement of women's and girls' empowerment for sustainable and inclusive development. To this end, we created a gender responsive security sector. We suspended the operations of the Bush schools in order to halt the practice of female genital mutilation. Alternatively, we launched the Economic Livelihood Program to empower traditional women leaders. In order to mitigate violence against women, girls, and vulnerable groups, we signed into law the Domestic Violence Bill. And in September of last year, responding to persistent violence against women, the Liberian president, Dr. George Manawia, among others, declared rape a national emergency and instituted measures to tackle such a civilized act. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the film Glimpses that you are about to view today is a short film of mixed emotions. It largely presents a partial historical background on the long fight, including by women, 
for their recognition and participation in global matters and decisions that affect them. It also reflects efforts by the United Nations in bringing gender equality discourse to the limelight and encouraging governments and institutions to act accordingly. It exposes how the treatments meted out to women differ based on cultural backgrounds. Interestingly, you will see how the actions of others in a given community cultivate positive changes in the behavior of others. We will see how happy a family becomes when a husband and wife exhibit mutual respect for one another and see themselves as equals. You will learn of the positive role and the importance of spirituality in achieving gender equality. You will realize the important role a family can play in promoting gender equality. You will also get to appreciate the continued effort and commitment by Baha'i international community in cultivating robust and resilient communities, strongly believing that this is where the lasting changes will take place. To this end, I have come to also conclude that love and respect for one another are key components to achieving gender equality and accepting that we are equals and no one is superior. Not to bore you any further, I would like to entreat you to view this short but inspiring film. I kindly urge you to pay keen attention to the wonderful quotes that go along with the film, one of which I would like to close with today. And I quote, the capacity to love, to create, to preserve has no gender, unquote. Lastly, from the Holy Bible, it says in Galatians 3, 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. I want to say thanks to the Baha International Community for this opportunity and special thanks to Safira Ramachfa for this invite, for the invite. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ambassador Davies and the Permanent Mission of Liberia to the United Nations for your kind commentary about the themes of the film you are about to watch today. The Ambassador noted the role of resilient communities, as well as the salient qualities of love and respect in cultivating positive changes in regards to gender equality. Finally, we will turn to the Ambassador of Portugal to the United Nations, Ambassador Lopez, for his contribution to this opening of the CSW screening of the film, Glimpses into the Spirit of Gender Equality. I would like to thank the UN Office of the Baha'i International Community for organizing this commemorative event of the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. 25 years since its adoption, Beijing remains a benchmark moment in the promotion of women's and girls' rights. But despite the progress, it is undeniable that much still needs to be done. And women's and girls' rights have also seen some setbacks along these past 25 years. We clearly need to counter gender-based violence, particularly sexual and domestic violence, as well as gender oppressive practices like female genital mutilation, child early enforced marriage, and human trafficking, and to keep on promoting sexual reproductive health and rights. Men and boys should also be included in our efforts to advance gender equality. The evidence is clear on how education is a driver of change. As it has been said by Malala Yousafzai, Nobel Peace Prize in 2014, and I quote, one child, one teacher, one book, one pen can change the world, end of quoting. This is key in the lives of so many girls and young women who have not been given a chance to develop their potential. In a gender equal future, every girl will have just the same opportunities as every boy, and women will not feel afraid, 
insecure or diminished for being women, but empowered instead. I thank you and I hope you enjoy the film. Thank you so much to the ambassador and the permanent mission of Portugal to the United Nations. And I love this point about a gender equal future where every girl will have the same opportunities as every boy and every man and woman will feel empowered. So really thank you so much to all four of our ambassadors for your warmth and encouragement of this film that we're about to see together today. So we're now going to turn over to watch the film. And many of the communities that you will see in the film are involved in community building processes that aim to empower individuals and local populations to take charge of their own development and work for the transformation of their own societies. And part of what that looks like is striving to work through any imbalances of power towards creating community dynamics and relationships that are based on trust, unity, justice, and equality. And the film is trying to open up a broader conversation that advances towards gender equality. Um, humanity is making these advances on two broad fronts. So one is towards change in the structures and systems of society that have for generations been steeped in injustice and inequality. And on the other front, the change of culture and hearts and minds to embody those principles of gender equality. So as we watch the film, um, you may like to keep in mind two questions. And these are the two questions that we will open up with in our breakout groups. So the first question is, what opportunities are opening up to contribute towards gender equality at this moment in history? And the second question is, what hopes or aspirations does this film leave you with? And I'll put these two questions in the chat for you to think about as you're watching the film. So for the best viewing experience, you're welcome to turn off your cameras um, and expand your Zoom screen to full screen so you get the best image quality. And we will turn over to the film um, before breaking into our breakout groups to hear your reflections and feedback on the film, glimpses into the spirit of gender equality. Thank you all so much. In 1945, we thought, oh, at last, peace and prosperity, and everybody was working, and things were going up, and all of a sudden we started choking on what we were doing. Noble have I created thee, why dost thou abase thyself? Our destiny is noble indeed. Many people say if it could only be as it was when we were children, when things were simple, why can't it be as it was? And I was thinking, it can't be because all the people living in those old houses have changed. Maybe the houses haven't changed, but the people have changed. And the times have changed. And there is no going back anymore. of this conversation is to talk about the progress that we've seen in the 25 years in the advancement of women and gender equality. At a time when we are commemorating the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Conference in 1995. The UN has done what it does best, which is to help surface and raise the visibility of this issue, but it hasn't been able to do what governments and the culture has to do. Mm -hmm. I think what we are learning 
within Baha'i communities is that we have to be investing in building strong, resilient communities at the local level, because that is where the lasting change, the sustained change is going to happen. We have a goal on gender equality, the sustainable development goals, that also accepts and says very clearly that even though it's a standalone goal, it cross cuts with every single other goal. And we shouldn't take it for granted or assume that this was kind of natural. It took tremendous effort. An open letter to the women of the world from the women delegates and advisors at the first assembly of the United Nations. We call on the governments of the world to encourage women everywhere to take a more active part in national and international affairs. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights may well become the international Magna Carta of all men everywhere. We have learned valuable lessons in the past five years. The attitudinal prejudices which stand in the way of women's advancement are held by women as well as by men. Time is short for us to rectify the present unsustainable patterns. We must achieve greater equality. We have proposed an equal rights amendment. Those delegations who are in favor of draft resolution one entitled the role of women in the preparation of societies for life and peace, raise their hands, please. The women's movement is about changes in a society, about changes that are global. We want this to be remembered as a conference of women, by women, and for women. I declare open the 41st session of the Commission on the Status of Women. We have to give real meaning to the ideals of women's equality. This has been a century of women's emancipation. Hey Jane, was something we all share. Today, we all own the great responsibility of implementing the platform for action. The first 63 years have been momentous. Today, let us be clear about what needs to change. So the World Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995 was like a springboard for many women and many organizations that were working on women's rights to help us see that uh, women's rights and women's advancement is not a Western feminist idea, but it is very much in their culture. I was born in Malaysia. My father came from China as a school teacher. My mother was a local born, a Peranakan as they call it. And like many women of that time, my grandmother had bound feet. Hers was about six inches. Now, the mother had bound her feet when she was an infant. And um, the beauty was described as a, a woman with a three inch feet walking and swaying like a weeping willow. So she suffered a lot from the binding of her feet that deformed her feet. To walk is really very painful. It took a lot of courage of my grandmother not to bind the feet of my mother. And because of that, it liberated me from this tradition of bound feet. Oh yes, 
This yeah. is Beijing. Oh, it's Beijing. That's, that's Beijing. That's Roz Harris. Yeah. And Virginia. Wow. Oh. Which one's you, Mary? I'm not seeing you. Here, yeah, you won't believe it, but that's. Oh, that's no. you. That's right. I remember the yeah. suit. Yeah. Yeah, that's Mary. Yeah. That's right. Oh my gosh. Uh, there's a long history of the bi-international community with the United Nations. And uh, for a long time, it was one person who carried the burden, or however you want to look at it, and that was Mildred Matajeta. And she certainly was a mentor out there for all of us mm -hmm. to, on the international level. That period of time uh, was ending uh, just as I came in, really. So Mary will remember that when I came to the UN and she was the representative, we used to have many different agencies at the UN that were responsible for gender equality. It was all over the place and there was no unity. When uh, the Commission on the Status of Women was meeting, it so happened that I was the chair of the NGO Committee on the mm. Status of Women. Mm -hmm. Uh, just like Mary had been <laughs> 10 years mm -hmm. before that. And so we decided to send a letter to the Secretary General Kofi Annan. And finally, in 2010, a resolution was passed that created UN Women. That's so nice, because also 25 years after, yeah. after Beijing, um, now at the United Nations, they're thinking about all of the different ways of advancing this. So they're working at the grassroots level, they're also working at the national level with their governments, they're here at the international level. And we see that gender equality today is very much at the forefront of the public mind. And what's really nice is that young people are thinking about all of the different ways of advancing this. And we're seeing that happen around the world, which is really exciting. My father, he did not want his daughter to go out, for people to see her outside. There was also the question of caste, because there is a lot of difference between upper caste and lower caste families. And while I was from an upper caste family, the man I wanted to marry was from a different caste. He lived in the village, and his background, his way of living, was very different from mine. However, my only wish was that I could live there and would be able to serve the community the way I wished to because my husband would give me equal rights and I would be able to move forward with him at the same pace, side by side. But when we went to different places to serve, many people made fun of us. For example, when we used to come back late at night, my husband would help me wash clothes together or sweep the house while I was doing other work. The people of the village used to laugh at us would talk behind our backs about our actions. But slowly over the years, I saw some things change. One day, I was sitting outside my house, and I noticed one of my neighbors pick up a broom and start sweeping his house. I started to laugh. He asked me, why are you laughing? Your husband also sweeps the house. I thought, maybe a transformation is taking place, and I'm happy you're doing this. We could see now for parents, they really believe that in terms of, for example, preparing food, they really believe that it is the women who can only do that. If they are going together in the field, they, the husband will only carry an axe around. But to find that the woman is carrying heavy buckets on her head with cassava, including vegetables, 
the husband will not help. You cannot come near to a, a woman who is preparing food. It was not allowed at first. So even these boys and girls who have been growing, they could see that difference. The husband would just come and shout at the woman to say, why are you not cleaning the house? Why are you not preparing food at this time? But him is just sitting like this, waiting for a woman. A woman will come from very far from the farm. She's very tired. She puts there and then start touch other things. She does this and this. And then she gives first food to the men. Her, she will eat at last. But now men, they have come to see that this barrier that we created to see that this is for women, this is for men, it is really pulling us down. We cannot grow. We recently became parents, our daughter is almost a year and a half, so that really brought in a whole new element of what housework looks like if you're striving for gender equality, what income looks like if you're striving for gender equality, what childcare looks like. For us, gender equality doesn't mean sameness, so it doesn't mean that like we necessarily do the same tasks the same amount, but somewhere in there, there's a balance. I think the biggest barrier remains to be expectation of what is equality mean and how do we as a couple and how do we as a family really address that expectation and and when it's correct apply it correctly and when it leaves much to be desired how can we alter that in how we live our lives but i think it's one of the things we've discussed a lot where kimmy is very driven in her career and as am i so we say well how can we um, both succeed out there in the world as well as at home with equal voices in our marriage. Our daughter has so much joy, like I think even more than the average baby, maybe I'm biased, <laughs> but she just like screams with delight all of the time. And you see how women in this world are, are barraged with so many things and so many challenges. And so I know these challenges will come her way. For her to keep that bit of joy for herself is gonna, going to require, I think, resilience to all these challenges that come and just you know, having the tools to, to take the world for what it is and, and make it a better place, but retain that part of herself that, that is so valuable to me and so valuable to, to many others, I think. One of the things that I think we both think about a lot in raising Rumi, our son, is cultivating his gentleness and giving him the space to be who he is. He it has this boldness and he has this courage and he has this energy um, and he has all these things that I know people are going to like love and encourage about him because he's a boy, but he's also he's full of gentleness and thoughtfulness and compassion. He's so observant. He sits in silence beautifully. He is like creative and collaborative. He loves beautiful things. And those are like these attributes that are just as beautiful about him. And I don't want any one thing to mean that he can't be the other thing. As a Baha'i, understanding the unity of the world uh, is, is something that, that we really hold dear. And raising Rumi is one of the things that I think I do as a member of the human race. Starting a family really feels like we're beginning to participate in a, in a dialogue that, that exists across the entire world. It's not something that exists in America or something that exists in Asia. It's something that we all do together. Nosotros como we as a family always consult. We always consult. So even though they are very young, there are issues that we consult about together that are at their level of understanding. A quote that inspires me and that I love is the one that says that the two wings of a bird are like the man and the woman. And when the two come together, the bird can fly with strength. And an example I give is that of my brother, who when I do a job, he helps me. And this way, we can progress together. Well, it's important because, like, if I let my sister do all the chores alone, she's going to finish, but she has to do other things. She can't be doing house chores all the time as if she was working here.
जब मेरी शादी हुई 2008 When I got married in 2008 those days newlywed brides were not allowed to go out of the house निकलने नहीं दिया जाता था तो मैं एक विद्यालय चलाता था I used to run a school so two or three days after the wedding we went to my school so that she could start teaching children लेके आया और विद्यालय में पढ़ाने के लिए बोला लेकिन उसके अगेंस्ट फिर गांव ऑल ऑफ द विलेजर्स वेंट अगेंस्ट मी फॉर डूइंग दिस सेइंग शी इज अ न्यूलीवेड ब्राइड एंड दैट आई कैन नॉट टेक हर आउट लाइक दिस दे टोल्ड मी ऑल सॉर्ट्स ऑफ थिंग्स बट आई इग्नोर देम नहीं दिया एवरी पेरेंट विशेस दैट देयर चिल्ड्रन टेक द राइट पाथ इन लाइफ कि उनके बच्चे जो हैं वो सही रास्ते पे चलें इसमें मेरे भी इवन आई होप दैट माय थ्री डॉटर्स टेक द राइट पाथ इन लाइफ एंड कंट्रीब्यूट टू द कंस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ अ बेटर सोसाइटी This is my wish. आगे बढ़ के समाज के लिए कुछ कार्य कर कार्य कर सके, समाज में अच्छा बदलाव ला सके। बस यही मेरी इच्छा है। बच्चों को When we focus on their moral and spiritual education right from a young age, they stand out and contribute in transforming this society, this world in a better way. अलग होते हैं और वो समाज में दुनिया को बदलने में अपना बेहतरीन योगदान दे पाते हैं। men have to be able to contribute and to say that it's women's issue kind of infers that men can't contribute to their betterment but as men are often referred to i think they must be referred to as potential contributors and we certainly know the problems that have been caused by patriarchy but there are men willing and ready right now to contribute in a meaningful and appropriate way to the advancement of women. I think part of what allows toxic masculinity to flourish is it is actually the suppression of of what might be true masculinity, you know, which is not the expression we've seen, you know, we see something that's contorted. I mean cartoons, the sort of things that we expose our our youngest people to. um are full of even just i think visually these these certain ideals you know a a, a man with a extreme v <laughs> broad shoulder you know he's he's good for a few things and a woman who's shaped like an hourglass who's also good for a few things so we actually start force feeding our our youngest um our children our babies like tropes more or less and what does a spiritual perspective allow us to consider then you know if we, if if it, not that we discard the material but we include the spiritual so together what kind of perspective might we have of a man you know well first i mean i think it's safe to say that that we we we're, we're still exploring what healthy masculinity is the same way that women have been oppressed that means a correlative suppression of what it means to be masculine our our uh, our male dominated structures are maybe of the latter kind they are they are too rigid they're calcified they're 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 hard and therefore they will break but but what kind of strength is it to be elastic to bend to be receptive you know this reconceptualization of of man and woman is also the reconceptualization of society i'm not sure exactly what principles boys need to learn at an early age to be proponents of gender equality but i know it needs to be learned as early as possible and the thing is is that it can't be just one segment of their lives you can't have their parents teaching them about gender equality and then their grandparents don't you can't have them learning gender equality at home and then when they go to out into community activities where gender equality is in practice so the entire community has to contribute to that and it means that everyone has to be on board every single person that that child that that boy runs into has to enforce this ideal and that makes the change generational
25 years ago, more or less at the time when I began to work in education, parents would say that to study was not important. I remember once a gentleman arrived in the community and I tried to convince him to let his daughter go to school. And the gentleman said, I have animals, I have land, and if my daughter is going to study, if what she is going to learn is to write letters to her boyfriend, then I don't want to. Within the challenges that exist is that education should reach all communities, but a quality education, a holistic education that thinks of people as whole beings, a whole human being that is composed of three natures. The physical one, his or her body should eat well and be well nourished and have a dignified life. The intellectual part, his or her capacity. Human beings have many capacities and how they develop those capacities through education. But they also have a spiritual part. Through that spiritual part, they can show that they are kind, honest and truthful. And that is what we need. And if it is received in that holistic way, we can do many things, achieve great things. But the setback in the communities and culture is sometimes because the person is intellectually trained but is not prepared to make a good decision, to be fair with what he does, to be equitable, to be kind. Then that is the part that is really needed. Tomar una buena decisión para ser justo con lo que hace, para ser equitativo, para ser amable. Entonces es la parte que que realmente se necesita. ये जो नैतिक कक्षा ये बच्चों के लिए बहुत ही the spiritual education of children is very useful. If a children starts attending these spiritual classes, these Baha'i children's classes, then it's like when you plant a new tree. When it becomes big, it will provide fruits, shade and wood. But if when it was small we didn't give it enough water, so spiritual education is like that small plant that if we water it with spiritual qualities, then it will be beneficial for their future to its parents and to their community. They will grow and then emerge as a beneficial resource for the community. We study while seated in a circle to show that no one is superior to the other. We just study together. If you miss a point, others will help you, because we are all learning like everyone else. In our study, we learn a lot of things. We learn about confirmation, justice, respect, and many others. The relationship between the animator and the junior youth is that the animator needs to be a responsible and well-informed person so he can effectively assist the junior youth. Therefore, at this stage in life, the junior youth needs someone older than them to help guide them in their lives. The junior youth study a number of texts which discuss a number of spiritual qualities, such as being generous, loving each other and other spiritual qualities, and what is helping them to recognize positive and negative forces in their community. Before in the past years, it was difficult for women to be free around men. It appeared that men were always in the forefront, implying that the women are behind, making it difficult for women who had thoughts to share. Some texts discuss qualities such as perseverance. If they see challenges in their communities, but they do not have the quality of perseverance, they will feel hopeless to face these challenges. But if they understand well the concept of perseverance and patience, they will be confident that with time, they will end these challenges the community is facing. I think with regard to the, the impact of the, the junior youth program on the families of the junior youth, I think one element that we've observed, basically, 
in our community is everyone is participating. I, I think to me, that already is sending a signal to the family to say, the same task that a boy can perform, also a girl can perform. Because when you are doing the services, we don't like separate this kind of work is for the girls or this kind of service is for boys, but they do together. So you could find that when we are carrying out these services, it was raising some questions from the parents in the community and then trying to ask what is happening. Even the, when they, they get back to their homes, they are also taking those things which we are doing at the group level to their families. Previously, according to our community culture and practices, men didn't really have trust in the capacity of the women in terms of their ability to contribute to opinions and knowledge. But gradually, women have shown their capacity and are now known as equal to men. Men are also gaining trust towards women. As village leaders, we have many responsibilities and are not only concerned with the education and religion of the villagers, but we are also concerned with the empowerment of women. Women are regarded as an important component of the community. This village will not develop further without women. Women help us to reach higher nobility. For me, I understand that the sort of context of the divine doesn't exist within this, this binary of men and women, but it's something that really, it's something that surpasses that. It's something that goes beyond what we can understand of this physical world. I really see my own faith as being something that helps me understand qualities of compassion and justice and equity and equality. At the United Nations and, and many governments um, around the world are thinking about material markers to help us identify where we've made progress and where there are gaps in, in the status of women around the world. At the same time, the proliferation of inequality, of oppression, um, of injustice in, in any way, and, and, and in this sense against women, is very obviously a spiritual problem, but it has expression in our material systems because we live in a material world. So the structures of society inevitably reflect our values, but our values are spiritual. So to only have material meters and markers is in a way to hamstring where we're able to succeed or what we're able to accomplish. When you look at the power structures of religious practices uh, over the course of, of, the, of millennia, they really have done a very good job at sidelining the voice of women and promoting the, the voice of men in those power structures. 
And I think that's something that we have to look at objectively and atone for because it has inhibited religion itself's ability to, to achieve what it is meant to achieve for all of humanity. But again, that's just the practice of religion. I also think that the history of religion is a history of trying to understand the world around us through a spiritual dimension. And it has always tried to confront the new challenges before humanity. And just like uh, in, in you know, decades and centuries gone by, those religious leaders who are willing to embrace it and question it and learn about it are, are going to be pointing humanity, I think, in, in a wonderful uh, direction. In many traditions and culture, as well as religion, women do not lead press. Women are not allowed to say press at certain periods of the month. Women are not considered fit to be the one that can uh, hold the holy books or touch the holy books. Right? But the Baha'i devotional meeting changed all that that everyone was equal, even a girl child, could say press, could be the one to lead the press, could be the one to uh, have people unite together in one voice. So Baha'i devotional is a way of us seeing ourselves as um, individuals that have a spiritual side, and this spirit can be connected irrespective of what is our outer differences. Slowly, we started having devotional meetings. We started inviting people from different localities in these devotional meetings. There were many questions as to why God has created us all in the same manner, or why does God love us all, and in His sight, no one is high or low. We study documents about health, documents on unity in society, how to love each other. After reading, then everybody gives their suggestion on how things can be organized, what change can be brought, what can be done in the family, how our children can progress, how to stay away from bad habits. Some of the women are shy and do not talk, but slowly they have started talking and understood their responsibilities and how to put it into action. From what I've seen, when places try to apply these qualities of, of justice and equality, oftentimes the results fall short because what they're trying to do are create masks on material structure. But what really needs to happen is, is an entire transformation of that sort of level of the soul. So when we have this, a conviction from a spiritual place that all people are equal, all people have this inherent nobility, all people have limitless spiritual capacity, then the way that we can push forward becomes so much stronger. People who live in totally different conditions with totally different backgrounds to really come together as a collective and share how despite this variety, we still can learn from one another, we still can pick things up from one another's experiences in these really special ways. Really, it was just the beginning when I was at the UN. We made a statement on the importance of the girl child and the importance of educating the girl child. To the Commission on the Status of Women in 1974, and uh, there was really not a lot of reaction to it at that time. However, when I was in Beijing for the Fourth World Conference, it became part of the program of action. That was another step forward. It was really a thrilling moment. It was 
it was the influencing the process to the ultimate. And the director of the Office for the Advancement of Women at the UN came up to me and we high five. <laughs> it was really a victory. It took time. Everything takes time. It's process, process, process. Yes. But it was a wonderful moment. I've been thinking a lot about how important it is for the work that the UN does in keeping world peace. And one thing that I want to link back to what governments can do more for the education of girls is to safeguard this peace. Peace is so fragile in this day and age and education is so dependent on peace to persist. Gender equity requires the culture of peace for us to have a sustainable future. What are the desirable and urgently needed dynamics and traits and qualities that we want to see in the world and how do they begin to play that role in a way that is both bold and humble and open and informed. So I think in education we have this rich opportunity to, to engage our imagination um, and to think very carefully about what is the world that we're building and how are we giving the tools spiritually and intellectually to our young people to come to the forefront and to play that role. So this has been really a road of 25 years. It's a learning journey for us, trying to put Baha'u'llah's teaching of equality into, into reality in all sorts of community. In this process, we hope to bring about a glimpse of a civilization that has both material and spiritual qualities. Material civilization is like a lamp. It's beautiful, it's a glass lamp, but without the light of the spirit within it, then that lamp doesn't realize its purpose. To be a civilization of the future, we need both the material and the spiritual, and both the qualities that men and women has to bring to advance this civilization. The equality of men and women is a facet of human reality, and not just a condition to be achieved for the common good. That which makes human beings human, their inherent dignity and nobility, is neither male nor female. The search for meaning, for purpose, for community, the capacity to love, to create, to persevere, has no gender. Such an assertion has profound implications for the organization of every aspect of human society. Since 1995, much has been learned about the enabling conditions that foster gender equality. Whatever setbacks and obstacles may appear over the next 25 years, the awakening of the majority of the peoples of the world to the truth that women and men are equal will never be lost. So I hope you've all enjoyed this film, Glimpses into the Spirit of Gender Equality. And so now we'd really like to hear from you, your reactions, your reflections on the film. Um, we will move into breakout groups and each breakout will have a facilitator. There'll be small groups of around 10. And again, those questions that will start the conversation in the breakouts are what opportunities are opening up to contribute towards gender equality at this moment in history? And what hopes or aspirations does this film leave you with? Um, and then from there, you're also welcome to delve into some of the deeper themes that the film touches on. Once you're finished in the breakouts, there, there won't be any formal reporting back to the main plenary. But if you would like to come back to the main plenary, there'll be just a space to informally chat. We'll have some of the film team, a, a remarkable film team that actually put this film together, who'll be ready to share 
some of their experiences about making the film and open to answering any questions. So at this point, I would like to thank everyone who's been joining us live on Facebook Live and YouTube. Um, unfortunately, we can't have you join one of the breakouts, but we encourage you to send your comments and reflections to glimpses at bic.org. Again, that's bi glimpses at bic.org. We would love to hear from you. So with that, everybody who is here with us on the platform, I'm going to move you into breakout rooms and your facilitators will take you from here. Thank you all so much. Thank you.